let's begin. Uh, so glad to be here today. My name is Bree. I'm the chair of the coordinating committee. It's, um, it's not that. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just learning. I'm not, I don't know what I'm doing, but it's cool. Um, so really glad for you all to be here today. It's nice to see so many familiar faces um, and really nice. Yeah, it's a nice little community we built up. Um, so I'm really grateful for everyone who's here and especially for our speaker and especially for uh, those from Thunder Bay and, and from elsewhere, it's really exciting. So thanks so much. Um, always important to start with, uh, with a land acknowledgement. And so uh, many of us here are gathered on uh, Treaties 1 and also Treaty 2, uh, the ancestral lands of the Dakota, Nakota, Anishinaabe, Salto, Ojibwe, and Cree nations, and the homeland of the Métis nation. Um, we know there are others too from other treaty areas, and um, we're glad for everyone to join us. Um, also, we acknowledge that our energy comes from Treaties 3 and Treaties 5. Um, so always important to, um, to start with that. Uh, we are going to switch things up a little bit um, today because uh, our elder is our speaker, is our elder, and we're so glad to have her, um, Elder Marge here. Uh, so we're, I think Yvonne is still actually driving in, in, in Thunder Bay trying to get settled. Um, so we'll call on them uh, for introductions once they get settled and they have their uh, meal. Hi, um, I'm Debbie Dandy, uh, a member of the coordinating committee. Um, and I too would like to welcome our elder, Marge Roselli, who has been our honorary elder for all of our sessions. And we've appreciated her insights and, and teachings as we've gone along. Um, I have, I would like to present Marge with tobacco tonight. <laughs> um, the traditional gift to uh, offer her and thanks for her teaching um, with us and uh, through all four of our sessions, we thank you for that. Um, she'll, Marge typically gives a blessing and says a few words before we start. Tonight she's going to do that and then just proceed with her presentation. Um, so we'll turn it over to you, Marge. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, do a smudge for before I speak, before the prayers. And it's a, a smudge of sage so that we can uh, be rid of any negative thoughts or any negative feelings or bad feelings. I know that uh, the subject I'm going to speak about is, is hard. And uh, I've uh, come through that journey in my own personal life and through the lives of many of my community members. So I'm going to uh, start out with a prayer in my own language. A blessing. Um, in the Dakota way, our words are sacred. And whenever we meet, we get together, meetings, whatever, we do everything with prayer. We ask for the blessing of uh, Creator God, Wakantaka. And even so far as to give me the words to speak that people will understand. Because Dakota is my first language. I didn't learn English till I was about eight years old when I first started school. And so I want to have my words blessed and my words uh, given to me that I'm going to present tonight. And I pray for peace and good thoughts for everybody. <laughs> I took it a dark or the shake over the Kanoka. We had my girl who shook him up here. There he worked. Shake the shin. Who showed up a torch? He did not shut taking away your work. Joy in a home, Kahne Hapak. She would just the money up to here be Hanatana. Who she make it a dark with no one. Amen. So I ask for the, the blessing and the understanding of those who are going to hear my presentation. And I want to start with a bit of history 
or my people, the Dakota. Dakota Sioux, they're called, but we call ourselves Dakota, the friend. We've uh, traveled a long journey. We are in our traditional homelands here in the treaty made with the U.S. and the Dakota Sioux the, called the Great Sioux Nation of 1851 identifies Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, southern part of Manitoba, uh, southern eastern part of uh, Alberta, southern part of Saskatchewan, and uh, south uh, western part of Ontario as uh, being a part of the Great Sioux Nation. And so sometimes people say, you know, you sought refuge in Canada, and the government refused to acknowledge us as as being here, and they called us refugees, and we've been labeled with that by federal government. Uh, they said they were granted land by the grace of Her Majesty the Queen, and we ascertained that this is our traditional homelands that we reside in. So it's been a constant battle for recognition. You know, we've uh, been hunted from the start of the Battle of 1862 in Minnesota, when our people were being intentionally starved by withholding of uh, food supplies that were promised uh, if uh, weapons and horses were given up at that time. And uh, the government did not release the food on a timely basis and our people had to, to fight for, for food. And that's how the, the battle started. In our Dakota language, it's called uh, the battle of the stomping of the eggs because uh, warriors went into the barns to catch chickens and they stepped on eggs while they were trying to get food for their families. And that's where my history starts. My great great grandfather, Bokava, was a part of that. And uh, was a part of the Battle of uh, Little Bighorn. And he rode with the uh, Sitting Bull when he came into Canada. So I know my history orally that far back. My dad uh, told me I've not written it down. But we've come through many, many hardships to get to here now. And then, of course, we all know about the 60 scoop and the residential school system where our people have been targeted and decimated and been the subject of genocide. And we are still here. We're still resilient. We still know our language. We know our ceremonies that we carried on underground. And Indian agents lived on the reserves and forbid all kinds of ceremonial practices. Now we see a lot of other tribes have adopted our, our ceremonies. But we've remained strong and we're still here. But that's where our hardship started, is with those kinds of things that happen in our lives. You know, our, I come from three generations, my grandparents, my parents, and myself, we were all in residential school. And it's, it was a hard time because you know, boys and girls were separated. There was no affection. Our parents knew very little about having a nuclear family and caring for that family. Showing love and affection was hard because they didn't receive that in residential school. Or even in my day when I went to residential school, I uh, was kept away from showing any signs of uh, affection for other children and uh, there was always predators around, you know, and uh, a lot of our people suffered. So it's called carried within within our hearts and our minds, those things that happened. And some have been able to heal, like myself, through ceremony, going back to the land, going back to our traditional way of life and doing ceremony and being able to overcome those hardships and to make good lives, you know. One thing that was instilled in our parents was the work ethic. Our parents were very good workers. 
and they, you know, our people had big gardens, fed their families, took care of them, but it was the affection and the love that was not shown, even though it was there. As they were stifled in their growth, being in a residential school. So those are the things that have brought us to where we are. And then having our children taken away by the 60s school. And the uh, documents shows that uh, children were taken away due to poverty. No, not for any other reason than for living in poor conditions. But, you know, we, we all grew up like that. I was born in a time where we didn't have no hydro. And I always remind people, look, I didn't have TV when I was small. We didn't know what cell phones were, you know, we didn't have electricity. So it's so, hard trying to learn that technology now. We've survived. And a lot of our people have lived really good lives, but there are some still who have not been able to move beyond the hardships that they've endured historically. And I think that's what really, really affects our, our young people during hard times like this pandemic we've come through, being separated from family, from friends. We gather, we feast together, we have you know, family celebrations, we have ceremonies we do when somebody dies and we have for a funeral, for a wake, where we get together, we eat together. We also have memorials a year later after somebody dies. We get together, we have a feast, we give gifts to honor our departed loved ones, and we give gifts to honor those who are attending. All of those came to a halt a year ago, the pandemic, and, and it was a hard year because we had so many deaths past year. A lot of it was, you know, natural deaths. We had about 60 in one year, 60 deaths. And for a community our size, that's huge. So in many cases, we had two deaths in one day. We had an elder, a brother and a sister pass on the same day. We had a, a mother and a father and a daughter pass within a week. And that uh, particular young man, his niece died on the same day as him. So we had a number of those where our community was really hit hard by all these deaths and we could not get together to show our support, sharing our grief with each other. There was nothing we could do. A lot of cases you have to go straight from the funeral home to cemetery and have a burial and Everybody has to stand apart, you know, there's no hugging, no shaking hands because of the pandemic and, and limited us in sharing our grief. And a lot of young people, I think, went underground with their drug use. Maybe they couldn't get their drugs, I don't know, but we were also hit with so many suicides of young people, the youngest one being 15 years old, be a year ago this month. It's the first one that happened. Many, many attempts that have been made after that. It just took a huge toll on the number of people dying. And the majority of those deaths were not older people that you'd think would be dying, but it was middle-aged people, maybe in their 40s, early 40s, mid-40s. It was a devastating time for everybody. And so if there's a bit of alcohol or drugs involved, then I guess it seems like life is hopeless. Maybe for them, it seems there's nowhere, nowhere else to go, nothing else to do but except take their lives, not realizing the devastation it brings upon their families, their friends, not being able to get together to share that grief has been extremely hard. So there were two state of emergencies called within my community this past year. One was when the pandemic started on March 16th, it closed the offices down except for essential services. 
I retired as the health director as of end of February. So I went through, we had to go through our list and establish who was essential, who had to go home due to age or medical conditions. We had to cut our staff down and just get right down to the bare minimum of staff. We had to make many adjustments so that people didn't have to go into town to get the medical care. We still continue to have the doctors come, nurse practitioner come to the health office for appointments to see our people. We had to cut down the transportation. We had to install, install safety shields in our transportation vehicles and many, many adjustments. So that was the first state of emergency. And then the second one was called in October of 2020 to the suicides and uh, the number of uh, deaths within the community and the attempts that were made. Chief and Council issued a band council resolution declaring a state of emergency and sent that into uh, federal government and also notified the MKO, the Northern Regional Law. Uh, tribal organizations so that they could uh, mobilize their emergency response team. And they were very good at answering the call and they've been sending workers in every week to help us deal with that because there was only one mental health worker and two addiction teams, uh, two addiction staff that were able to deal with the tragic events that were happening. And I always went with them to talk to the people who were experiencing the tragedy and bring comfort and offer hope and support. But we also had to do it from a distance, talking to them with our PP on and being at the front lines. We have an emergency response or a crisis phone line that's been in operation for gosh, since the 90s when we also experienced a huge number of suicide and attempts in mid-90s to late-90s. There was a phone line established for help for anybody in the community. So we had a team there of about a dozen people that we would call upon when something happened. We'd get together and we'd go talk to the families and friends. So we were able to mobilize that within our community. But we were also very thankful that MKO sent two workers down every week. We also received help from federal government to send the a therapist then who comes in two, three times a week to assist her. She's always put solid. Mind you, that didn't really put a stop to things. We still had, oh, lots of contacts, follow-ups to relatives that were affected, to the friends that were affected. We had to go out and offer support and try and set them up for counseling and dealing with their problems, uh, dealing with the situation that they've gone through, trying to help alleviate their sorrow and comfort them and encourage them somehow. We did that every week. We went through a huge list of people. We all were working in a coordinated effort to assist the community members any way that we could and necessary would send them out to uh, to uh, you know, the treatment centers or uh, wherever they could get additional help and counseling. So that was a, a huge task while also dealing with the pandemic. I had the first case in uh, January 11th. We had gotten through uh, since the previous March with no cases. I mean, we were part of ensuring that the you know, we were not uh, contracting the virus in the community or bringing it into the community. We're isolating people who had to go out of province, maybe for medical care, or, and even into Winnipeg. We had the first case in January 11th. And then there was three, three clusters that we had to deal with. But within one month, February 11th, we had completely gotten rid of the virus within the community. Mind you, we had... Rooms, rooms set up in Brandon. We contracted with a hotel in Brandon to people, you know, 
safely into isolation there and made arrangements for support services and also for meals to be delivered three times a day. And if they were positive, then we sent them into alternative uh, isolation uh, units in Winnipeg. And so we, we worked really hard dealing with both of those state of emergencies within community and uh, utilizing whatever support, whatever staff, whatever volunteer people that we could use. And it was uh, a hard time, but it was also, you know, a learning experience, how we can work together and offer hope to each other and provide that needed support for one another and to work at rebuilding our community, ensuring that everybody is safe. So we still, we had to set up check stops and coming into our community and going out to the community, but we're just now, uh, you know, cutting down on those uh, checkpoints within the community. Mind you, we know that there's been no cases and uh, the province has been going low figures in the, in the virus, but still we maintain our vigilance and uh, trying to ensure that nobody else gets infected with these new variants coming in. But I had a wonderful um, staff of nursing, uh, worked really hard. And I think there was the three of us worked nonstop for 21 days, even on weekends. After, after hours and it was hard to pull, but we were able to make it. And I really uh, commend the staff for that, the nursing staff. I know that even though I'm not there at the helm anymore, that they are continuing on with their work and keeping the community safe. And I know the mental health team are also there. Crisis workers are there carrying on working with the community. And uh, the other thing that I worked with in, in my time there was uh, establishment of a, of a healing lodge as uh, Catherine Nicholson, Jerry and Kennedy presented last week on uh, the grave sites at the uh, former Brandon Residential School site. I have been a part of that. And uh, we're actually, I was actually the one that used to set up the gathering every year. And... Uh, Evan Miller knows that he was there to present also and uh, gathered a lot of information from the survivors. He questioned them about what they wanted to do because this healing lodge um, was formerly a proposal that was done. I believe it was in the 90s by the former health director who used to be a uh, a chief for a long time. His name was Robert Bone, the late Robert Bone. He was also my older brother. And he started this uh, treatment center effort. And he worked with Southwestern First Nations in Manitoba. And he had uh, band council resolutions from a number of the Southwestern First Nations in support of having a a treatment center because there's nothing located in this area. And he also had a, a letter of support for BCR from a Southern Chiefs Organization. So there was a lot of support for that and it's uh, been a hard uh, venture to deal with because it's very hard to get funding. I think now uh, a feasibility study a proposal has been sent in lately to uh, try and bring into reality the healing lodge that we have envisioned for the former Brandon Residential School site. As the vision there is that we have been blessing that land, praying and smudging and, you know, had gatherings there with good thoughts and good intentions and prayers that the former site where there was so much sorrow and so much sadness and death for our students would be turned into a place of healing and hope for our people when it eventually becomes a healing lodge. 
So we've been working very hard at that. Uh, even though we have not been really, really successful, we, you know, when we find some funding, we go ahead and take a step in, you know, getting plans drawn up and uh, how to develop the land into a place of uh, serenity, peace, you know, maybe put a, a fountain there or something so people can go there and collect and sit. There's a lot of... Uh, work going on that will need to be brought into reality eventually. But the, the thoughts and the vision are there and we're still working on it. The real work that has to be done is what uh, Catherine Nichols is doing. Because there are a lot of anomalies in the land from uh, former residential school students who recall babies being buried behind the old uh, residential school building and along where the tree lines are, but the land has changed since then. The tree lines have changed. And it took a while for them to try and locate where those, those uh, sites were. At one of our gatherings, we had some of the older women there who took Catherine out, I believe, and showed her the spots where they thought they uh, saw somebody, a child being buried, or a baby because a lot of our students suffered uh, sexual abuse and some of them had children right in the residential school that were buried there or, or they were burned in the furnaces and they were witness to that. So that's a part of our, our historical trauma that we've gone through is to have our people witness those things. And it wasn't just our people because we had lots of uh, other First Nations that attended school there, even from Saskatchewan. I remember my late mother had a, a correspondence with a woman from Northern Saskatchewan that she went to residential school with in Brandon. And they used to write to each other until the lady passed away in 1994, I think. I drove her up there to the funeral. So there were lifelong friendships that were developed and, you know, both uh, my older brother and my older sister went to residential school in, in Brandon, and they themselves witnessed things. I saw a boy being killed, and uh, lots of uh, lots of trauma that they've had to bear. And uh, they've talked about it, and I think it's been recorded. But those are the kinds of things that our, our people have gone through. So now we want to keep on working to bring that healing lodge there so that it can have a different ending to what started there. You know, our people would be able to go there, have healing ceremonies, have counseling, you know, and have the help that they need to deal with that historical trauma. We need to exactly find out, find out where those uh, grave sites are and have Catherine work on them. And we've asked uh, at our gatherings what other First Nations think we should do, whether we identify the spots and just uh, make a little park around, on, uh, put a little gate or a fence around it and plant flowers there to commemorate it. Some people don't believe in moving, exhuming bodies and burying them elsewhere, but with thought maybe they could be exhumed and buried up at the existing cemetery. But that also has to be completed there, the work that was started, identifying the additional sites around the fenced-in area at the existing cemetery on the north, north hillside. So those are uh, work that needs to be completed before we can actually do any landscaping or excavating or trying to build on that site. So it's still uh, quite a bit of work that needs to happen there. And we're very hopeful that as time goes on, that it will eventually become a reality. I know the pandemic has put a lot of uh, restrictions on, on what could be done and how the work can proceed, but I'm hopeful that eventually that the work will be completed for that site first. And then, of course, there's a site down at the 
former current park. I think it's called Turtle Crossing now again. That uh, other site is and that needs to be determined on what's going to become of that area. And we, I remember we had a meeting with city council at one time and the owner of the park was there. And uh, we had asked if, you know, the trailer and the uh, uh, sheds that were situated on that grave site would be moved, but I don't know if anything has been done since then. Uh, of course, there was no uh, agreeing with us that some children were buried there, but eventually I think we came around to seeing that, yes, this is a possibility looking at the, the diagrams of uh, old uh, maps of that area, that there was a grave site there, many grave sites actually, not just one. So those are the things that we've had to deal with. And, you know, um, we don't know who these children are. Uh, as, as Kathleen said, how do we go about determining what first nation they came from? There's been a lot of speculation on what could possibly be done. But no pragmatic plan has been developed about what we're going to do. I think we need to have another gathering or talk to elders and you know, determine what to do, give uh, get clear direction on what should be done with those grave sites and then proceed from there. But I'm not a, a member of, or com of the committee that works on that. Like I said, I just retired and I used to be an active part of the work that was going on, but I have since uh, retired. So I'm still hopeful that I'm able to contribute in some way and help with what they're doing. And, you know, I use the information that I have uh, gathered in my lifetime because um, I've worked in health many years. I was uh, the Tribal Council Health Director for, for Dakota Ojibwe Tribal Council with eight communities for, for Ojibwe and for Dakota communities. And then from there, I went to the Southern Chiefs Organization where I was a health advocate for 34 Southern First Nations. And then uh, I was asked by the, the chief then to return and manage the 26-bed personal care home here in Sioux Valley. So I left my job at the Southern Chiefs Organization and I came home and worked in my community as the manager for the personal care home. And then I... Uh, Step back from working for about oh maybe four years, and then I was asked to go and be an interim health director while they were looking for a health director here in Sioux Valley. So that was in 2014, and now 2021. I'm <laughs> finally retired in end of March, but I have uh, worked in in uh, Sioux Valley from the outside and their health uh, objectives and plans that they had. So I knew of the work that was undertaken for the development of the treatment center in the early days when the work first began. And that support is still there, I know, because we met with the council, chief and council from the various First Nations in the southwestern Manitoba area, and they very much support the idea of having a, a Dakota uh, theme uh, healing lodge where they can go to get relevant call Arnold because you go to go sleep pretty soon so I believe the work will continue am I putting somebody to sleep <laughs> uh -huh. But, uh, yeah, so I am there to uh, support and work with whoever is willing to have me, you know, provide some input on whatever it is they want to do for uh, the future development of the Healing Lodge. It's still ongoing. And uh, I'm always willing to listen to, to people and help them as an elder here in the community. So... I know I'll never uh, truly leave my position because people phone me and text me and 
to still ask me things and I'm only happy to uh, help provide whatever I can to assist them. So it's been a, a, a hard uh, a hard journey for my community. Uh, we have about uh, maybe close to 3,000, but we have about maybe 12, 1,300 who live on reserve. And so losing 60 people in one year was a tremendous loss for us this past year, compounded by the pandemic. And then further, uh, further, uh, uh, with the problem with the suicides, it's been it's been extremely hard in our community, and we've just now started having small gatherings. There's an elders meeting not too long ago at the end of uh, February, and I know they're getting together um, for different things, but still maintaining social distancing and wearing masks, and you know we still have to maintain the uh, guidelines for uh, keeping the virus at bay. So. Hopefully things will pick up as the weather warms up and our numbers stay low in the province. We'll be able to do more work outside and maybe Catherine will be able to come back and work at the former residential school site. You know, it's uh, the hope that I will be able to see the healing lodge come into reality in the future. I am 70 years old and uh, I believe I still have a few years, if not lots of years, to to work alongside anybody, because my people are my first concern, my first priority, and I want to help them maintain wellness. You know, I want them to be well, body, mind, and spirit, and we can achieve that by working together at the goals that are, you know good for us in our community, not only for our community, but the surrounding communities. And the healing lodges I see is a very important objective that we need to work on continually until we see a, an actual building. We see we have plans, we have blueprints that have been developed by our community members. And we worked out the budgets, you know, the staffing that would be required. We just need to get together some funding and start uh, building soon. I don't know about uh, the feasibility study that's going to be undertaken soon. I hope we'll be able to identify what is needed for the site and what is required to start building eventually. And the work may be slow, but you know, you Rome wasn't built in a day, so. I know it's taken us a while, but I'm very hopeful that uh, the building will get underway. So, I don't know what else I can say. If there are any questions or... There's, there aren't any questions yet, but feel free to put them in if you have them. I have, uh, I have one son. I have 10 grandchildren. And, uh, I hope that I have been able to be a good influence to them that they don't know about the residential school. They don't know about the 60 scoop. I've had many relatives who have been through the 60 scoop and they've all been given money. I went to residential school, but I was at Dauphin and because I didn't spend a night in the dormitory, I was put out into a private home where a lot of us were placed with Ukrainian families, we didn't understand their language, but you know, I didn't, uh, I wasn't uh, uh, given a funding for being in a residential school because I didn't spend one night in the dormitory. But when I look at all the money that's been paid out to people, it didn't bring them happiness. It didn't bring them healing. Now we have the 60 scoop, we're getting what, 21,000 I think each, it's not going to bring happiness. It doesn't bring, you know, healing. I think we need to go beyond that. When we talk about reconciliation, that's what we need. We need healing lodges. We need treatment centers, whatever they want to call them. Something that will help us throughout our lives. That giving of money 
is just for a good party for some. And it creates more trouble and it creates death for some. And to me, that is not the answer. Why didn't they build a swimming pool, a hockey rink, or, you know, something that we can use, something that would help us develop our lives more, give us something to do. Our young people, what do they have? There's nothing on reserve. You know, I marvel at the little towns when I drive through. You see towns that are under a thousand people and they have a store, they have a gas station, they have a movie theater, maybe a skating rink. They have, and I think to myself, why don't we have those in our communities? Those would help our people. I give them something to do. You know, they have a covered uh, an indoor skating rink. I see kids out here who build an outdoor rink. They're out there at night skating, even if it's cold. Gives them something to do for a short period of time. Why can't we have a bowling alley? You know, why can't we have a swimming pool? Uh, we used to swim in the Cinnaboyne River a long time ago when I was a child. Now it's so polluted, nobody wants to set foot in it. Why can't we, you know, have a skate park, skate skateboard park or whatever? We see some of our children going down the paved highway, Highway 21 right runs right through my reserve. They're going down the hill on, on the skateboards. They don't have anywhere else because the roads are dirt roads. And that's just like an accident waiting to happen if a speeding semi comes barreling down the hill. But we need facilities, recreation facilities. We need to build up our communities for the youth. And especially this healing lodge would be such a wonderful, you know, place if they could go there. They could take part in ceremony in a safe environment, a peaceful environment. If you have a swimming pool there, maybe go swimming, have a sweat lodge there, take, take part in a ceremony. All the things that we could do to bring healing, we don't have. And I think I can speak for all First Nations when I say, this is what we need. This is what reconciliation should be. Because injecting money into somebody's life, most of them don't have a better life out of it. Maybe some of them will buy a vehicle. They get stopped because they don't have a driver's license. It's impounded. They can't get it out. They lose it. Yeah, so it's been it's been a, a long journey. And I think about how our, our people can benefit, how we can go forward to a better life. For, and I mentioned my grandchildren. I have 10 grandchildren. One is 30 and the youngest one is one. Hmm. So what, what is good for them? Is it education? To some extent it is, but having a, a healthy, well-rounded life, you know, healthy emotionally, mentally, physically, yeah. is what I want for my grandchildren. <clears throat> right now we have, you know, diabetes, so prevalent in all First Nations. We made a, a little detour in our traditional healthy lifestyle because we were raised on buffalo, which as we know is the healthiest meat. And we made use of the whole buffalo to eating junk food now. Mm. Trying to, you know, help our young people, you know, eating pizzas, uh, unhealthy foods, things we didn't have getting them games. Uh, what do they call those? Those PS3s or whatever, those kinds of things. And they sit inside and they play their games all night long, sleep all day. So their lives are turned around. 
And it's not healthy for them. We know that. But what else is there for them on a reserve? There's nothing else. And if we don't have what we need, you know, we try and fill it with possessions instead of what we really should be giving. I can see. Thank you, Marge. Thank you, Marge, so much for sharing so far. There's a number of questions that have come in, and I can relay those to you if that was a good time. All right. Sure, that was a good time. And um, whenever you're ready. And um, yeah, and there's also someone waiting that would like to share a comment as well. But I'll start with these a couple of questions that came in around uh, what the Healing Lodge could look like. Um, one of them asks, what program service, programs and services do you hope the Healing Center might offer? And will the Healing Lodge provide mental health services to these youth or is it inpatient services? What do you think that, what do you hope that will look like? Well, the vision is that we would provide a full spectrum of services from mental health to whatever is needed, counseling, um, in-home care, to stay there as a residential, you know, uh, place, residential treatment center, but also as a, a day treatment center, if that's what they prefer. And mental health counseling would be a first priority, addictions counseling. So those, the full spectrum. Thank you. Um in a similar vein, what does what do you expect or what do you think will address the suicide rates of youth? Do you have thoughts of what can be done? I think it was what I was just talking about. If we yeah. could provide them, <laughs> provide them what they need in the community to occupy them. And certainly yeah. it's the outdoor physical recreation yeah. sports. Yeah. Um, and I'm building on that. Is there is there federal funding or local funding to help build these amenities at all, um, like a swimming pool or a hockey rink that improve the quality of life on the reserve? Where is the funding? Where could the funding come from? Do you know? Well, if we were able to access that kind of funding, I'm pretty sure we would have had all those now because, sure. you know, it ha it has to be uh, negotiated. If it's not really needed, well, I've never heard of federal government funding a swimming pool or any other physical fitness uh, buildings or facilities or anything like that. Hmm. Thanks. That's why I said, right, reconciliation should include those kinds of things. Yeah. Real pragmatic things that we can use in our communities. Yeah. So when you put words to action, you know, action to concrete things like facilities, that's reconciliation working at its best. Hmm. Thanks. I noted that, Faye, you had your hand up. Did you want to share anything? Uh, hi, and make rich uh, Elder March for, for sharing your wisdom with us and identifying these problems. Um, if I, my question was sort of around the funding, and I think you've identified, uh, you know, what it, what it would look like, but have you know, is there any way that uh, I don't know what kind of funding you'd be looking at to to be able to build what you're looking at? Have you got any idea of what that would cost? Uh, that's the first part of the question, and the second part of the question is if uh, people did fundraising for you, uh, where would that money, where could that money be sent? And would you, would that be a help or would that not be a help? And that's it. <laughs> well, if we did a fundraising, it would have to be for a specific um, thing like the healing lodge. And that's where it would go specifically for that account has to be set up. And if we were able to access any type of funding from federal government through a proposal, we would have done so already. You know, while I was health director, we were able to access additional funding for um, the pandemic by submitting proposals. So 
I think we were able to access about a million dollars, you know, for food hampers and for isolation sites and for uh, setting up a quarantine site if it ever came to that. So we did proposals for those and we were able to access funding for those. I think you're talking long term, though, not just short term, correct? Am I correct in that, that you're talking you're talking about something that would be there for 20 years, not something yes, that's going to come in home right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. I guess, I guess maybe if I could, just one more, and I'm sorry, I'm probably monopolizing time here. But, but what is it that we, that, like I live in Winnipeg, what is it that I could do to help you guys, to, to help? there as one person or as a person with contacts and, and a group of people or whatever. Is there something I can do to help in this process? Well, you certainly can. You can advocate for us if you know people on how we can go about uh, accessing funding. Uh, you can always contact me or you can contact the chief. Her name is Jennifer Bone. Thank you. There was a, another question that came in related to um, uh, uh, related to Catherine, and um, who said it, who I think was on the call. I don't know if she still is, but uh, is Catherine working with the committee now? Just curious who would would be still working on identifying the children or working on getting the campground and Brandon to respect the cemetery? Catherine is still working with Sioux Valley and she okay. has a committee that she works with. Okay. So we've been very thankful for her help that she's provided so far. And we also have Craig Miller, who's mm -hmm. been uh, a good advocate for us and working with us also. I noted that Craig has his hand up. I'll, I'll go ahead and call on him. We also, there's also another, uh, Tommy also wanted to make a comment, but since Craig was, you just mentioned, go ahead, Craig, if you wanted to make a comment. Thank you. Um, and Marge, it's, it's good to be with you even in this virtual space. So I'm just curious, um, when I attended the government round table with you in Winnipeg, I believe that was January of, 2017, the federal negotiator said at the time that he thought the government was going to put forward a proposal. In fact, he told me he was fairly certain that the government was going to put forward a proposal to make that happen. I take it from what you're saying tonight that, like, has there been no movement on that, no additional indication, no, no sense that support is coming no i have not heard anything at all and i don't know who is pursuing that now i guess it would have to be the chief maybe you could call her up and remind her greg i think it would be helpful well it's just disheartening to hear following that meeting and i know following the roundtables that you were doing on a month a monthly basis correct that 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 hasn't, you know, that there hasn't been at least some additional communication or some type of, of support from the, from the federal government. Well, yes, it's, it's unfortunate. I think I was, uh, that was when the old council left. We had a new council come in. So sometimes priorities change or you know, some things inadvertently are prioritized over other things. So I think we need to keep this on uh, the chief's table. I would suggest that maybe we could give her a call sometime and speak to her. Okay. Thank you, Marge. I, I look forward to seeing you soon. Mm -hmm. I do too.
there's a number of comments asking about about some of the same kinds of things about how do we can we support and whether or not um, lobbying on behalf of Sioux Valley to the federal government would be helpful at all. Um, so something that perhaps we can continue to explore. Maybe you have more additional comments on that. Um, and Elder Tommy, I think, has stepped out. He wanted to make a comment as well, but I think he might be out. Yeah, I think a lot of uh, lobbying is required by people who know people. Sometimes, you know, you, you get the best contacts and information informally, you know, with people mm -hmm. you know, people who know people. Yeah. I'd appreciate any kind of assistance for this. It's very important that mm. we move ahead on this project. Yeah. My people's lives depend on it. Not only my community, but other, you know, First Nation communities. The longer we wait, I mean, things aren't going to get any better. Hmm. There's a, a similar a question about um, kind of stepping back just a little bit about uh, you mentioned earlier on that your community has worked really hard over the years on recognition for Sioux Valley and your people. Given that the Dakota were not original signers to the numbered trees, has the Dakota's journey towards self-determination been different than other people groups here? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Hmm. We, I always say we still own the land because we didn't sign, sign any treaty. And when that treaty in 1851 with the Great Sioux Nation in the United States, we, we left that area also. So, you know, they may include us, but uh, I don't know if our chiefs from that era signed anything. So, tongue in cheek, that's what I always say. We still own the land. <laughs> But yeah, I think it was, uh, uh, what would I say? Uh, a way of uh, federal government uh, to kind of recognize us, I guess, with the self-government or trying to set us off on our own path with the agreement for self-governance. You know, it's a tripartite agreement with Manitoba and Canada. So essentially, um, it left us in a, in a more serious or difficult situation financially, I believe, because uh, the indexes were not adjusted according to current inflation, our population, and at times the province uh, or, yeah, the Manitoba First Nations would get funding increases and we would not get it because we already had our five-year agreement set up. And so we need to continually advocate and lobby and, and ask for, you know, additional funding that others have received. So it kind of locked us into the agreement that we have, which to me is not, uh, wasn't the best for Sioux Valley. And I know because when self-government was originally started in the late 80s, my late brother was the chief. And when he started the process, I was working with him then in the self original self-government uh, framework agreement that was uh, signed in 1991 until I worked in self-government until 95 when I went to Winnipeg work as the health director for Dakota Ojibwe Tribal Council. So I still remember the contents of our, our uh, original agreement that we had proposed then. So it's far different than what was agreed to and signed by the three parties. It's more limiting. Interesting. Thank you. Um... Another question that had come back, and I'm just re relaying the questions, uh, going back a bit to the Healing Lodge question, do any other Manitoba First Nation communities that you know of already have a Healing Lodge or something similar that you might be building on? Well, 
They do have one at the, uh, oh, what is that? They have a couple of them in, uh, I think in, in uh, at a Norway house maybe? And uh, north of Winnipeg, one of the communities there, they have a, a healing lodge. Maybe others on the call know them. Have I know Manit them. Not Manitoba has a couple of them, but across Canada, there are a lot of First Nations that have uh, treatment centers. You see, we, we went to BC to, you know, find out how they got funding for theirs and how they established their, their treatment center. And there's also one in uh, Alberta, Kainai, that we uh, took a look at to see how they managed to build their treatment center. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Elder Tommy, is, uh, I think I might be back. Is um, Are you able to unmute? Yeah, Ivan, there you go. Yeah, Tommy's here. Can you hear us? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, I was really interested in the Dakota lady when she was talking. I, ima I imagine she is pretty well, uh, how would I say, exposed to the... Uh, what we are now experiencing, exposed to the uh, white society and she's able to talk pretty good English. And I believe I'm about the same age as her and I have problems talking because I'm not fully exposed to the white society as we, all right, hello. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, you said something about reconciliation that struck me right away too because I was trying to understand what reconciliation meant and I've listened to a lot of young people you know like my age and their age is quite a bit quite a bit of difference and there's a lot of changes within that thing that happens and I, I, I felt what everybody was trying to say in reconciliating is trying to get back what they have already lost, even before the, uh, what do you call, there's a word for it too, uh, before the doctrine of discovery. Yeah. You know, we had a lot of things going for us. We had our own doctors, we had our own teachers, we had our own scientists, if you, if you have to say it, but scientists wasn't the word in those times. <laughs> And our people, I, I say this with honesty, we're able to bring back the dead within a 24 hour speed. Now we can't do that. And that's one of the things I, I believe we will never be able to get back reconciliation. But a lot of times that you had mentioned, I believe it can happen, it really can happen. And once that happens, I think we can, we can begin to uh, feel the way we were say eons ago. And one of these things is, uh, it would be pretty hard for me at, at my age to try and say how we can begin a process to try and bring back a lot of things, not just one area where we can say, let's bring back what we've already lost. And that's through residential school. And that's through uh, laws that is not ours like we were able to get food if we wanted to. We went and either hunt for it or set traps, not traps that would, would kill uh, <laughs> in a slow fashion, but we didn't believe in killing and stuff like that. We made uh, real kills like death walls and stuff like that. I mean, I don't even want to talk about those things because I see it in my own way in my own way that we are killing ourselves. And you mentioned a few of them, that's addiction. You know, our people are, are lost with those things. And 
before when we talk about before the doctrine of discovery, there's no such thing as addiction. Uh, drinking wine, whiskey, beer, and now you've got all kinds of liquor, I notice, it, and that's, these are called coolers. And these is what our children are, you know, they, they, they find it very easy to get it, even though they're not old enough, even if they're not having a piece of paper saying that they're old enough to get it because they, they look more sophisticated than we did a long time ago. So these are the things that we have to try and find a way we can uh, help one another. We call that we soak again in my language, it's Ojibwe. And I believe you have the same thing in your language, Dakota, where we don't just listen to one another, we look how we can be able to help. And this is what I think you are doing, which is good. The other thing, my friend here, Kathy mentioned to me that the meeting is going to be about uh, uh, youth suicide. I see with my own eyes, I come from a small community called Grass and Arrows. I didn't know I belonged there until my uncle told me, let's go to your reserve. We're going to get some money today. Well, at the door time, it was a brown check with a black black stripe in the back, $5. <laughs> But in those times, those were quite a bit of money. We were able to buy flour, sugar, lard, you know, things that we need for our food, meat sources, stuff like that. What I see there is that, you know, the children really loved their parents, their grandparents, their big brother, their big sister. The smaller you are, you depended on them more then you depend on anybody else today. Like you, you don't really depend on Indian affairs because they fund you only if you do the things that they, they wish you to do. What I'm saying is that I see this with my own eyes when I went back to my reserve. I see children as young as eight years old committing suicide. And the reason for that is because they have just heard what they heard about their dad, their mother, what happened to them when the residential school, and that was, you know, getting hit with, with, a, with a knife or an axe or a spear or something. And, you know, they, they just couldn't understand why, why these things are happening. And I've seen this already. I've seen this with my own eyes because I was chief too in my reserve 1974 to 1980. And we try to make a voice for our children. And we still need a voice for our children, regardless of now, because they are much more capable than people my age now and when I hear them speak. Boy, you know, they, they, they're really good English talkers because they talk far too quick for me, they sound like a, an auctioneer, like I, I can understand, but you know, you can tell how educated they become. And these are the people that I believe we, we must take a real good hard look at it to see how we can provide them with the necessary tools to be our spokespersons. Because uh, one of these days, I think this is what we're going to see. We're going to see more female chiefs than Indi uh, male chiefs. And I say this not because, you know, I'm against <laughs> my, my male brothers, but, you know, we tend not to say the things that we're supposed to. I've seen that also. I witnessed that also. Because in my time, I was younger when I was a, a chief at the time, and I spoke what, 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 what was happening to our people. And what was happening when we spoke about it, it was more being sweep under the rug than any trying to, trying to mm. have the society help you with, with what you are uh, having trouble with. So these are the things, it's is good that I heard you saying that the healing arts is one of the best ways to do it. And we need to get all the elders from different sections of the uh, land that we now, that we now are not in control of, of our, of our needs. And we need to prepare something that 
This is how we will be able to help ourselves, our children, to get back what we've lost without our consensus, I believe, if I can use those words. And I would like to answer questions too, if somebody would, would, <laughs> would ask me. Because I, I believe I, I went beyond the scope of being the chief. I, I ended up uh, with a good friend of mine, Louis Cameron, Rodney Seymour, and Joe Bird. We were all young. We are occupied what is known now as the now Bay Park. And today I keep hearing the same thing. If we were to listen to the young people at those, those years, and it's not a park wouldn't have happened, Oka wouldn't have happened, Wondini wouldn't have happened, but we got one good group that came out and they're all a female group and they call themselves, I don't know more. And I appreciate that, but where are they now? I don't think we're, we're in a supporting need. And I think that's got to continue. Be wet. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate your words. I think the elder is quite right in saying that we need to keep our, our minds on how the youth will go forward and helping them. Because in our language, we always say the youth the children are our future. And so it's their well-being that everything we do now for seven generations affect them, that it be done in a positive manner so that they can live good, healthy lives instead of the way they're going now. And that also includes including the land because we are a part of the land as First Nations people. Whatever happens to the land happens to us. And I've always worked at uh, trying to conserve and protect Ujimaka, Mother Earth. And I was down at Standing Rock in 2016. And I was there when all those thousands of veterans came in to show support for our people in their stance against uh, government and the building of that uh, pipeline and so everything we do like I said we think about the seven generations ahead to come and so this work that we're doing now you know it will help those youth those that are not yet born those that are coming if we do the work that we set out to do and it's very important to me as a, a mother and a grandmother Whatever effort we make, we make it for the, the young. So I want to thank all the people who have uh, listened and been a part of this. So if you have any more questions of the elder that just spoke or myself, be happy to answer if I can. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, you are so true what you're saying. And I, I believe that what needs to happen next is to see whether we can keep contact. The, the more people that are able to speak, the stronger and bigger we will become. So we need a voice, not for just for one nation, but the whole nation. And I think uh, Chief Chicken Bull was one of the chiefs that, that did that. He did it nationwide, and a few other chiefs. Sagatje was my chief. That was my great grandfather, and uh, he said that the treaties were not right for us. And I believe that a lot of words have been changed. So this is the thing where I'm saying that we need. You said it. We need to take a stronger grip on our younger people because they are a lot smarter than I believe we were anyways in terms of uh, English language and stuff like that. Like I mentioned, I went to universities to speak to students and they the questions that they asked me, I couldn't have answered because they're too fluent in English. So 
I, I say I thank you for your questions, but you sound like a, an auctioneer to me. I don't understand what you say unless you uh, say the real slow so I can understand. And it works. But like I'm like I, I hear keep hearing too, time is, is what is essential. They need all more time. Right? We need more time because we are still in 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 an unknown world because we live in two different worlds. Our world is different from the uh, the, the, the the dominant society, I guess, the society that that rejects the word Indian. That's what I I kept saying. One priest asked me, what does the word Indian mean to me? And that it come to my mind right away. The word Indian is a rejection from society. And that's why we, we got together at one time. But now that's over 40 years ago. I'm 76 now. And I feel that I got to keep going in order to show that you cannot give up what you're doing. You got to keep going till you see some kind of a, a stirring in the pot. <laughs> Hmm. Any yes. You're welcome. Thank you. I think that um, maybe next, uh, the next webinar series, we can also maybe look into Treaty 3 area and, and have some more conversation over there. I think that would be really important. Hmm. If there are any other questions, feel free to, to still put them in the chat or let me know or raise your hand. Um, there was a couple people going back just to, briefly to the Healing Lodge mentioned that in um, uh, both in the Nelson House and, and I think Vince Solomon mentioned the Seguin First Nation yes. also mm -hmm. also had uh, healing lodges there as well. Um, and then uh, Mavis also asked, are the terms of the Healing Lodge Treatment Center, are they interchangeable with the proposal that would be create that would be created at former Brand the Brandon Residential School site. Are they linked at all, or would that be a separate? Do you know? Well, I use them interchangeably. Basically, to me, it's a, a same thing. But when I say the Healing Lodge, it has more of a cultural component to it, so that we would use our, you know, traditional cultural practices of healing in the spectrum of services that would be provided for each individual, whatever they would feel safe and comfortable in, in undertaking for their own healing journey. Um, in terms of the yeah, funding, that wouldn't be any different. There, or there, those would be separate though. I think that was part of the question. Um, That's also um, what they call the NADAP funded treatment centers by Health Canada, First Nation and Health Services, those are deemed to be treatment centers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Elder Kathy also had a comment she wanted to share. I think she's going to unmute. Uh, bonjour, everybody. Uh, Marge, uh, 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 like Tommy said, that um, uh, you spoke some very strong words and a strong message in regards to uh, your community and um, in regards to um, just the history of your community up to the present and some of the positive things that are going on in your community, but also some of the, uh, the sad and uh, maybe re um, uh, really harsh uh, truths about our community, some of our communities that are uh, when, they're, when they are going through uh, hard times, um, uh, grief, uh, losing loved ones, uh, and, and this is what we are here for, is to share what we know or how we feel or have questions about youth suicide. Um, your story uh, speaks on behalf of so many First Nation uh, peoples in their communities north, south, east, and west, it does. And I believe that there are probably a few, maybe uh, First Nation communities that are successful, that have been, that are successful. And uh, I'm not sure how they, how they were successful. One of the communities that comes to mind for myself is uh, Sagin in Manitoba. Uh, um, 
one of the things that they've uh, been able to do is is uh, um, they have a, a, a grocery store, I believe, and a, a gas station. You know, that's something that's really, really positive. And it, it involves uh, so many of their band members, you know, that, they, that, that um, they're sharing. They're sharing that success. Another First Nation community here is in Ontario that comes to mind and is um, Eagle Lake First Nation, uh, who are very successful uh, in, in very similar ways. So um, I guess I know that we want so much to happen um, to be uh, healthier, to have healthier communities, to have more positive communities. And my, my concern here is for some of our, or for some First Nations communities that are, that are going through some really tragic, uh, sad times, um, I, I guess emotional times, you know, uh, speaking of mind, body, spirit, you know, it, it, it's, uh, I'm not saying that the entire community is ill, but they are going through some really harsh times when it, goes, when it comes to youth suicide. One of the things that was discussed uh, several years ago in, in, in regards to one of our communities, and they're trying to uh, come to some understanding and trying to come to some answers to, to, to help the youth, you know, because it seemed like they were, they were saying or they were sharing that was more like a trend uh, that uh, in, in regards to suicide for some reason, I, and, and, and they don't know that maybe it was the power of the dark side, if that makes any sense, you know, that, uh, or maybe uh, alcohol or um, uh, uh, um, drugs and God knows what else, you know, it's, uh, or a combination of all those things. And the community is suffering, you know, they don't, they don't have the answers, they want the answers. And so, like I said, because maybe, maybe with, with the First Nations communities that are successful, maybe there's, maybe we can come to, maybe we can get together with them and ask them, how did they do it? How do you do it? You know, how do you, how were you able to, to come together and be um, a happier and healthier community? You know, because they, I'm not saying that they were like that all the time, but they fought for it. You know, they did what, what, whatever they could, like maybe coming back to the traditional ways, the ceremonies, the language. I don't know. But that was that is what I wanted to, sh uh, to share. And also, uh, I think one more thing, the ripple effect, the ripple effect when it comes to um our old ones maybe who have gone through a rough time, uh, who may not understand um, what they were going through in regards to residential school, for instance, you know? And uh, it became, has almost become a norm of life. So what they learn, what they've gone through carries on into the next generation and so on and so on and so on. So that's, that to me, has there's just so much um i don't know going back to the beginning how do we go back to the beginning to be able to and do that healing to be able to 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 see more healthier communities you know what i mean that's what i wanted to share miigwech mm -hmm. thank you very much we have to stop that repeating of itself of what happened through prayer, ceremony, counseling, whatever help we can access so that we don't keep repeating those learned behaviors where the abnormal becomes the normal in our lives. And that's, you know, something we have to undertake daily. And as a a grandma and a mother, I always take it as my duty to pray for my community and my family every day that we will reach that point of being well, body, mind, and spirit. I'm a strong believer in the power of prayer. 
Mm. Thank you so much, Marge. Um, and for those words, um, I know that uh, changing those cycles and transforming is so important. Otherwise, they just, like you say, keep getting transferred. And um, so thank you for those words. And thank you. We're coming to the end of our time here now, but um, really appreciate uh, elders in Kenora there who are sharing, Elder Tommy and Elder Kathy. Also, uh, many others who have joined us uh, tonight and other nights. I noted that uh, Elder Mim Harder has also been uh, joining us and Vince Solomon has been a part of us and I really appreciate um, their presence tonight and all of you that have shared your comments. Maybe there's others as well that I don't know. And um, so thank you so much for joining us and um, for um, a challenging but very important conversation. I'll um, turn it over to Bree and then maybe she can turn it back to Kathy for closing. Yeah, I I don't know what to say that Carrie already has articulated so well. We're so very grateful um, uh, for you, Elder Marge, and for the elders uh, in Thunder Bay. And um, yeah, so grateful for that and uh, and for this the series that it, and for the efforts of uh, everyone who was uh, who spoke and who put it together and did all that all that work and effort and for everyone who came. And um, yeah, I'm just really grateful and thank you and yeah, thankful for all everyone's work. Uh, this is the last session in this series. Um, yeah, grateful for folks' attendance. Uh, there is a, a survey that Carrie sends out uh, just so we can make better plans moving ahead and uh, see what, what really resonated with, with people. Um, so that's it, yeah. I'd like to invite, yeah, invite um, the, uh, the elder to close. Uh, is that, sorry, I, I thought it was Elder Marge, but uh, Carrie said Elder Catherine, so I'm not quite sure who's closing. Yeah, no, Elder Marge. Just, uh, yeah. Great. Thank you. Hello, sorry, everyone. <laughs> I want to acknowledge the comments made by the elders from the, from the East. I thank you, and I hope we meet again. I believe I know Yvonne Verbo, if she's the one from Birdtail. <laughs> uh, if you ever want to get a hold of me my cell phone is still the same so I would want to close by uh, lighting the sage for a blessing for everyone everyone providing their comments is surely appreciated so I want to say a prayer of thanksgiving, acknowledge the creator, and I'm going to sing, sing you a thank you song after my prayer. A talk we woe had a kikina, kiksuya bawo yukcha, you ha umpte. A took the rona, o kiapi, o kiki pechana. Unkiap kaha bit was ye a teepik in day. They'll be chosen each upicta, was you kahapta. Like she would just die taha, he washed it, but forgot the kia. Oh, she checha, each hahapta, and a reda, no. So I've asked the creator to go forward with us in making this vision a reality that it will help the future generations of children that are going to come forward in the future, that the vision would become reality. And we thank everyone who listened, everyone who has uh, asked to help and contribute in some way. I don't know how we can uh, connect, but uh, Debbie knows my cell phone number. And if anybody wants to get a hold of me, you can do through Debbie. But I want to thank you, and I'm going to sing a thank you song for you in Dakota. Dakota, oh, na ma wangiero, 
とかしらひらまやえろへえちょぬぱきれゆはちえわきえろとかしらとかしらひらまやえろへえちょくるたおなまわりえろよとかしらやい、ひだまやえろへい。ちゃぬぱきれいよは、ちえわきえろ、とかしらやい、とかしらやい、ひだまやえろへい。Thank you, everybody.